Good morning, everyone. I would like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Kadirvel Palchami. He is our own alumni of TNAU. And uh, to say a few words about him, he has done his uh, MSc and PhD at TNAU Coimbatore. He has got postdoctoral he has done his postdoctoral research at AVIDC Taiwan. He has also uh, guided as a mentor for national postdoctoral fellow, Dr. M. Jagadishwaran, and uh, he has handled four research projects in SAFLA. And currently, he is actively engaged in ongoing project focused on exploiting genetic diversity to improve SAFLA through the genomic estate discovery of QTLs and genes associated with agronomic traits. I am very happy to introduce him before you. The floor is yours. <clears throat> so, respected Professor Dr. Maya Surin, sir. So, thank you for giving an opportunity to, to make a, another presentation again, sir. <laughs> so, I consider this an another credit seminar <laughs> for you <laughs> and uh, all the colleagues. Uh, I just want to briefly present what I uh, what we actually do at IUR. And in this presentation, I will be giving a, a brief about the national scenario of research, particularly uh, involving mark races selection in oil seeds, six oil seed crops which uh, Indian Institute of Oil Seeds Research is focusing. Because I have taken this topic because mass is an important tool for breeders and what we really uh, are, are up to. Because we have just listened to rice and we know so much of things have happened. Um, but just to give a highlight about what we actually do in this. So these are the crops which Indian Institute of Oil Seeds is working on, castor, Sunflower, safflower, linseed, sesame, and Niger. Of course, some of you may not even seen linseed and safflower and Niger um, because these are the important crops uh, there. And why we have to choose in the term niche oil seeds is because these crops are very localized. They they are not very major crops. So look at castor is a major crop in Gujarat, major area in Gujarat. Sunflower in Karnataka, safflower in Karnataka and uh, Maharashtra. Linseed, some parts of UP, MP, and Sesame, Rajasthan, and Madhya Pradesh. Niger, in some tribal areas of Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, and Madhya Pradesh. So that's why these are very localized uh, importance these crops have. And we have all India coordinated research project, almost 59 centers across these crops. You can see uh, how many states that we cover all these crops. And our uh, Indian Institute of Oil Seed Research is coordinating um, four crops. ASRPs and two other crops. Sesame Niger is coordinated by Jabalpur, Jawaharlal Nehru Krishi Vishwavidyalaya in uh, Madhya Pradesh. And you see what is the scenario here. You see overall, if you look at last 50 years trend in oil seeds, there is an increasing trend. But however, the major contribution of oil seeds in India, particularly this uh, uh, edible oil or uh, scenario, is comes from only three crops: soybean, rapeseed, mustard, and groundnut. 92% of production comes from these. Only 8% comes from the crops that we work on. So they are really, really small players. And there is a, another uh, research institute in soybean. There is an institute for uh, rapes and mustard. There is an institute for groundnut. So our IOR focus only on six, and they are very minor crops. Uh, crops and you can see the productivity trends. Uh, except castor and sesame, the acreage is drastically reduced in all other crops. So 20, 30 years before, they were 10 times higher area than what we have now. So the major reason they are telling is the productivity problem. Very low productivity. Of course, castor has the highest productivity in the world, they say, even better than China. But sunflower, safflower, linseed, sesame, niger, they have very low productivity. So that's a major reason why farmers are not interested. We can discuss a lot more in this for want of time. I'm not going into it. But the point is these crops are being totally neglected by the farmers for want of uh, better profit. So other competing crops are certainly uh, farmers are preferring. So what we do in breeding, basically, we use uh, only traditional methods. Not much of molecular breeding is happening. And of course, if you have to develop molecular breeding, it has to be a knowledge driven. And uh, we know the problems of traditional breeding, variation and complexity, low heritability, long selection cycle. These are all the problems and we see markers would be of useful. Certainly, markers breeding system will help because we can develop products faster and take into the market quite faster. 
so in that context it is all important and you know market market to bidding is not a easy thing to do you know when a lot of investments are required several uh, trades we need to identify we need market systems we need different strategies to identify qtls or genes and then uh, to have a particular uh, tightly linked markers or gene specific markers all so much of things are there a lot of investments is required and as you see in rice and all plenty of things are happening but in our crops not that much we are trying to add little bit of it but that i will be highlighting now the if to have a successful mass program i in my view i think these are things are very important resources in terms of genetic resources genomic resources and how many genes that we mapped how many genes we characterized without these information we cannot think of uh, such a things so i will be analyzing the status of our crops against these parameters the sunflower yes we have uh, five six years ago there was a reference genome was published plenty of work has been reported mapping markers and so on you see that traits i have listed many are there in because sunflower is a globally important crops so that's why a lot of uh, work has been done but some cases mass is being practiced with respect to rust disease down mildew and oleic acid and there is a comprehensive review paper which says where marker is actually integrated in breeding these are the traits i have mentioned about down mildew and um, warabanke high oleic restored gene stock of content for this mass is practiced but the traits that are important for our context indian context like yes, sunflower necros disease halchneria powder mildew to my knowledge nothing has been done powder mildew some work is going on even in tna also with our institute also but there is no thing that we can use right now so indian research is very much limited in this case and castor of course this is a very important crop and you know there we have the reference genome and again markers lot of resources have been developed so my colleague uh, dr santil has developed substantial genomic information in this crop uh, has got uh, snp markers of 6k array and all for the first time he developed it and and uh, see some work has been uh, these are whatever the references i showed you no know, that is the only report available in the world maybe one or two more that's it so that's the status uh, so the, i still there is no no marker that you can use in selection and but he has been but senthilwell has made a good good beginning in this uh, you know he has developed a high density linkage map you know more than 2000 snps map he has published already and then he mapped three major genes with the reference to fusarium wilt and gray mold resistance nematode resistance i think the fusarium wilt resistant genes are more thoroughly mapped now and is uh, taking them into mars uh, that is the first information globally and he has done um, uh, found the snp markers and he has did allelism test you know allelism tests are done to discriminate uh, different genes so conventional allelism test everything has uh, done it and this is already a, uh, a good progress he has made and he is developing nearest unique lines to take further into the discovery as well as functional genomics research so this will be a useful genetic stocks in the down the year maybe a few years we will be having those genetic stocks so this is uh, overall this is a progress in castor and with the reference sesame uh, of course there are sporadic efforts here and there reference genome is also uh, they have a draft genome sequence is uh, not completely available but uh, using the other sequences they have got uh, several markers and all and uh, many chinese group has done a lot of genetic mapping work mostly yield agro morphological traits some disease resistant related traits but again there is no single case where markers are being used uh, but now after realizing the importance of this crop uh, dbt is funding a network project where tna is also part of it more than 30 centers are involved they are developing a reference genome and a lot of uh, other phenotypic characterization of large germplasm collection of india and all those things gwas they are all planning like that so hopefully uh, in a few years time we'll have some more resources available for uh, some of researchers to continue but i think this is the crop as future uh, also important for tamil nadu because this is one of the important crops here and among all other oil seeds edible oils sesam has only 15 16 lakh hectares in the country no other crops which we work are there are one lakh hectare two lakh hectares like that so this has a future and not much work has been done even in basic breeding work 
uh, there are a lot of uh, gaps are there. Uh, there is a there is a hope. Uh, there is scope also in this crop to to further research. And then linseed. Linseed is a very important crop with reference to omega three. Alpha linolenic acid. This is the highest content of alpha linolenic acid, 50% in its oil. The best vegetarian source for omega three, and also it is good for flax type. I mean fiber crop. So because of that, you know some uh, international efforts have happened. Uh, some people uh, uh, worked on uh, improving this crop using markers, but still uh, there are no clear-cut markers available for uh, agronomic traits. Only for uh, selecting low linolenic as a low omega-3 content, uh, they have designed markers because uh, linseed oil is not good for uh, cooking. You have to eat directly uh, as such because it will get spoiled when you put it in high temperature. So when you reduce the omega-3 content, certainly it will be uh, making it a edible oil also. So in that case, we are also trying to reduce. The speciality of this oil is to have omega-3, but we are also trying to reduce it <laughs> to satisfy the edible oil requirement. Again, uh, DBT is uh, sp uh, sponsored already a big project in linseed. NBPGR is developing uh, lots of genomic resources, including the reference genome and so on. These are all the beginning. What I'm saying about these developments happened 25 years ago in rice. So we are now putting into it. And Niger, it's a very uh, interesting crop. It's a self-incompatible species. It's grown in uh, tribal areas, uh, some parts of the country. Uh, it's a very good quality oil also it is, but nothing has been done literally. We don't know even basics of this crop. We are doing ASRP for the last 30 years, <laughs> 30, 40 years, but no, we have not understood this crop. And then why to talk about markers and so on. So now I'll, little bit more details I'll give about safflower, which I am working right now for the last 12 years. Safflower, we have last year, I mean two years before, they developed a reference genome. And recently uh, uh, it was published and, uh, and several markers we have been using, most of SSR markers. So we are also developing and internationally also it is available. Uh, so I personally focus on mapping AFE tolerance in safflower. And one of your own students came here as a postdoc and he did that. And we also, I'm also working on markers for high oil trait. These two tangible things we could generate and very limited works on other traits, whatever. These are the only references available in Safflower. So whatever we do, we are the first. And we are taking baby steps. So again, DBT has sponsored a big network project with all these partners. I'm coordinating that uh, uh, from IOR. And uh, what we are trying to develop uh, a core collection of safflower, genotype based core collection, take entire collection about 7,000 and do GBS and uh, a subset of about 700 accessions for further work, which we have already developed my collaborator from NPPGR and we are putting them into GWAS. And for that we have multiple phenotyping platforms. Traits have been standardized. We are uh, for moisture stress tolerance, air free tolerance, fusarium filter resistance, and macrofemina. So these are the things we have, we have already, things are ready. So next year we are putting them into GWAS uh, uh, analysis. Then we are also developing a reference genome because I said when this project was started, there was no reference available in safflower. So India started developing on our own by the time Chinese people published it. But now we are having a reference, so it will be a second reference. So I think more and more reference will help us to have a proper reference later on to addressing gaps and so on. So that way we are doing and we are also developing reference genome for wild species. Karthama saxekanda is one of the closely related wild species of safflower that has very uh, uh, desirable traits so that uh, we are working on right now. And then uh, my colleagues from Delhi University also developed lots of SNP markets. We have more than 10,000 uh, markers are mapped on the linkage maps. We are also doing from IUR. And uh, with the uh, support of my colleague, Dr. Santelwell, we are developing lots of CAS buses uh, that can be used in uh, genotyping applications in castor, sorry, in safflower. Uh, what was he designed in castors, we are adapting in safflower now. Uh, those platforms, we have kept it uh, ready. And then uh, trait mapping, we are extensively working on. We have generated lots of populations, uh, more than 2,000 input lines we have made for the last three, four years. And the, so that's all put into mapping various traits and we are constructing linkage maps. Uh, multiple cross-based uh, populations we use for that because 
see uh, nowadays it's very quick to generate uh, lingesh maps but when we started 10 years ago not much was there so we developed multiple populations and uh, have tried to map polymorph markers in different population and put them together as a consensus map uh, like that so that we can have more markers in the map so we are uh, doing this uh, then with the reference to my qtl work so we got a major qtl uh, with reference to FE tolerance in soft flower. And there is no highly resistance in, to effort in soft flower. Even in other oil seeds like Brassica, they are still trying to search for sources. So we got one interesting QTL. And then uh, we mapped it. We used the phenotype, which I learned from PhD phenotyping. So we adopted here. And you see, whenever I do mapping, first thing is I doubt myself. Is it right QTL or not? It's very important because it will be misleading a lot. Uh, we don't know and several factors that uh, that leads to false deduction. That's why you see lots of QTLs are reported, but nobody even bother about it later on. It stays with the papers. So we, we, we try to analyze what are the way the QTLs I'm, we are getting is a real or not, those things. So we want to study in uh, different generations of the same cross. So we detect in the F6, we checked in the F10. Are we really getting it again? Yes, we are getting it. Then whether the, when it, Tolerance, when we speak, tolerance has multiple traits. It, it, it can have chlorophyll content, it can have growth factors, biomass, all these things are related to tolerance. So that way, we try to see whether we can redetect those QTLs again with the additional phenotypes. So we could see with the chlorophyll content, biomass, this QTL shows association. So I, I think we are fairly good enough uh, target for us to go further. Uh, then fusarium wilt is a major gene trait. I think genetics is relatively simple and we can develop it. So we started working right now with this. We have very good uh, phenotyping procedures and all. Uh, then oil content, uh, we have some indications because these traits like uh, FE tolerance, fusarium wilt, oil are major factors that decide the varietal release. Without these things, the varieties cannot be released. So we need to have better prediction tools for that. So that's why we are putting all those. Then uh, one case, as I said about volic acid, it's a clear Mendelian case where markers have been very much useful. We are, we are actually using it. See, when I look at our Indian varieties, they are all high linoleic types. Safflor has four principal fatty acids, palmitic, steric, linolenic, linole linoleic, and volic acid. So, Industry is preferring Volik because it's more stable. It has better oxidative stability. So every food industry is after Volik acid. Now in US, all the edible oils are Volik based. That's why everybody is after that. So we have an interesting mutation in soft flower, which has high Volik trait. And those exotic varieties that we got from US and Mexico, they're all 80% Volik. Indian varieties are about 20, 25% Volik. So it's a single chain, so you can easily uh, improve it. So this, I theoretically, I put why we need mass for a, a trait like Volik, because Volik is a recessive trait. So I don't need to go into the background for want of traits. So recessive traits, it saves time for us. And especially mass provides opportunity to predict heterozygotes. For Volik or some traits, you, some, the power for mass is only our ability to predict heterozygotes because we can't, we can't predict heterozygotes based on phenotype uh, in some traits like Volik and all, unless you have morphological markers. So that is the power of mass, so that we are implementing it here. So you know about markers backcrossing, all these uh, things. And uh, the marker that we are trying to develop for Volik is based on the candidate gene. And this is a pathway when, uh, Initially, when the seed develops, the oil accumulates, it will be oleic, then it gets converted into linoleic. If there is a mutation in oleic, uh, that fatty acid desaturated gene, then the, the pathway gets disrupted, it remains oleic. So there is a natural mutation. We did not create anything. It was already there. It was discovered 60 years ago, and that we are uh, now capitalizing it. And there is a publication from CSERO about uh, markers for uh, predicting oleic, but this is a multiplex marker. We need to put six primers into one uh, PCR mix. So it's very complicated for its breeders. I don't think they can use it very uh, effectively. So we wanted better marker system. And we looked at uh, the sequence of this gene, the allelic variation between oleic and low oleic and high oleic types. And you can see there's an indel. One single base deletion causes this high oleic trait uh, in soft flower. It's not like in other cases, like groundnut and all, you need two alleles. But in this case, one single mutation uh, is responsible. So we know what it is. 
and uh, then based on that we we started developing populations backrows and f2 and this is how we predict based on the just looking at the sequence i don't know any of you has uh, sequence a hybrid f1 uh, or uh, for this but uh, for a marker basically so this is a sequence based on say when we sequence it the hybrid plant will look like this based on analyzing the chromatogram we i can just say this is a hybrid plant this is homozygous is heterozygous and all but this kind of assays are very costly so we need low cost thing so for that uh, we need to design uh, other markers but here i want to emphasize one thing the coarse aggregation see when you are using marker for selection the marker should coarse aggregate with the phenotype and there are different terms that we use we use association sometimes we use coarse aggregation sometimes association works at population level so when you do qtl mapping you get a qtl is detected based on the association but coarse aggregation happens at one to one level so association is not equal to coarse aggregation so when we write papers we say when we find a qtl is a the mark it can be used in marker selection like that that's a very superficial statement once a marker is mapped based on association that has to be established in um, family based populations uh, in a one to one manner that's called coarse aggregation so you can see the way we have predicted uh, phenotypes homozygous means how heterozygous means how the only value based on gas chromatography it's pakka it predict i mean it matches with our prediction so this that's why this trait has been very useful and we won't be lucky to have such a traits in most cases unfortunately we are okay with it and in backrows population again one is to one segregation and you can see you don't find any high allelic things in the backrows because we get either heterozygous or homozygous for one parental type so this all clearly it matched and we design cas passes with the help of dr senthilvel so now we don't this is a non gel based method with the fluorescence based method all your rice markers can be converted this kind of things it will save a lot of time for you but anyway this is the you can predict you see whatever is one type of allele homozygous heterozygous and everything it's a co dominant type so it's very in one day we can finish thousand samples if you have dna ready 1000 1500 samples can be done in one day that much high throughput we don't need it but anyway so this is a scheme that we used and uh, now any safflower variety can be converted into high oleic without any difficulty and industry is very much interested in this kind of things and actually this work was funded by one merico company in mumbai they are uh, safola uh, brand uh, company and they wanted to use this kind of things so for that purpose we developed all those and i'm putting into the varietal profiling now in the asrp system also how the unknown genotypes can be predicted whether they are oleic or not because the globally one single allele is being exploited by breeders uh, and one of our variety is in the pipeline in the avia testing we have uh, is going on right now so then this is about all improvement safflower and we are also trying to broaden the genetic diversity of safflower with using the wild species axe canthus is a good source it has a tall drought tolerance it is a wilt resistant so many other things which are unexplored so we are developing interrogation lines with the support of dbt project and we have found some afe tolerance also because the wild accession you cannot directly screen so what we did is we made f1s with that and then uh, you look at the f1 how Uh, good they are you can see they are good enough for afe tolerance as well so we are still long way to go in this and hopefully we'll we'll try to enhance the productivity of this crop by introducing some useful genes from axe canthus so this is how we move on and uh, i come to an end uh why is that moving so sorry i was rushing because want of time and thank you uh, and these are the people who have funded our work i see our dst dbt is their merico company and uh, dr jagdish ron did a lot of work in afe talents and all uh, with his uh, with his project from dst and several my uh, research associates so many people more than 30 people have involved in this and i really acknowledge everyone and thank you so much for listening but it's a beautiful crop for genetics it's a very tough crop spiny every time when we make no no it is pakka no no it is self primarily self planted crop yes some often cross molt and sometime it happens no no not in safflower it's only niger and uh, sunflower niger is very severely incompatible whenever we crosses every time we lose two three drops of blood 
in safflower not beautiful like other crops like rice or tomato so you are unlucky that we <laughs> so good afternoon one and all so i profusely thank dr kadirvel for his wonderful lecture he was the student of our former director of research dr mageshwaran sir so many of the students you may not be knowing so marker assisted selection uh, marker assisted selection pathi engalukku solli kuduthavare sir da so i think sir feel very proud to see his student to exploit that marker assisted selection in the under utilized crop we all feel very proud to be our alumni of dr kadirvel to become a principal scientist and doing lot of research on this uh, safflower and other thing thank you kadirvel thank you very much for your uh, timely help thank you for your wonderful lecture thank you one and all sir thank you for your valuable time sir thank you